Welcome juniors and parents of juniors. I'm excited to be able to offer this opportunity to you, this video. It's the first of a series. So uh, I'm Frank Palmasani, one of the college counselors. My colleague Kyle Murphy will be producing a screencast and that will be a supplement to the background information you're going to receive through the video. So this is all about the college search and selection process. And one of the things we want to do is start with a clear understanding of the timeline. So often what happens is students make the mistake of beginning the process and then thinking about the end. They're thinking about what college should they be attending. So what we've done to try to help them in that process is we've broken this all into three phases. Exploration. You know, I like to think of exploration as a tennis match. In a tennis match, in exploration, you're in total control of serve. You have the opportunity to investigate, research, explore any schools that you want. Ultimately, that changes. It changes when you get to the beginning of senior year. So you're now a junior from now up through the spring, the summer, and into the fall, you'll be exploring college options. We'll talk later about those number of schools that potentially you might explore. But ultimately, when you return in the beginning of senior year, from the beginning of senior year till about December 1st, you'll be hitting phase two, the application phase, where you actually determine from that list of schools you're exploring what schools you should actually apply to. Ultimately, we'll get into the decision phase. Decision phase. Our current seniors will be entering that decision phase soon, within the next couple of months. The final college decision does not have to be made until May 1st. So you don't want to rush the process. The key is to understand the timeline and to focus on where we're at now, which is exploration. So as we think about exploration, what are we trying to center our mindset what are we trying to focus on as we develop this list of potential schools? Well, what we've done in this particular diagram is we talk about the integration of three important principles. What we want to do is assess if schools are right for us academically. We want to determine, are they going to have the right feel? And then finally, in an integrated way, we want to make sure that these school options are the best for the family financially. So let's break these ideas down. When we talk about academic fit, what are we really trying to get to? What are the key questions that we want to be asking ourselves to eventually get to academic fit? Now, when you get to the uh, screencast that you see uh, Mr. Murphy presents, he's going to give you the tool that's going to help you the most in answering these questions. But what are the questions? Well, the first question is, does the institution, does the university have the programs or major that I'm most interested in? Obviously, every college is not going to have every particular program. So you have to get that question answered. Now, Ultimately, you might be an undecided major. You might be someone not sure of what you want, and that's fine. But if you have some understanding of potential areas of interest, you want to make sure that those institutions, those universities, have those areas of interest. So that's question number one. Question number two is, okay, once you identify the schools that have the program, now you need to make a judgment on the quality of those programs, right? Because... There might be a number of colleges that have accounting, but is there a way that you can determine whether one accounting program is better than another's? Obviously, I'm using accounting as an example. So what has happened over the last decade or so is that there have been a number of entities, usually books and magazines, that attempt to create ratings of different colleges based on programs. And you'll see these, and you'll see colleges talk about this. U.S. News & World Report says we are in the top five in the country in business. This is an example of the type of marketing material you're going to see often. Understand, however, there is no universally accepted rating service. And so you can use this information 
as a guide, perhaps, but you're going to have to make some of these own judgments yourself when you get to college campuses. Maybe you want to talk to professors to really get a feel, to look at college catalogs, see what the course descriptions are like, to try to get a feel yourself of the quality of different programs. And then, of course, the final and probably most important aspect of academic fit is are you going to be giving yourself a good opportunity to be academically successful at the university that you're looking at or the universities that you look at? In other words, you are going to know, and we're going to give you this information, this data, you're going to know where your strengths are. You're going to see what your GPA is and be able to compare that against the students at that particular school. You're going to be able to look perhaps at test scores. We'll talk about test scores later and how colleges have, have changed in terms of their use of test scores. But if you take an ACT test, you'll be able to take those results and then see where would you fit in at this particular institution. Every college talks about a mid-range. So let's use my hands as an example. The mid-50%. The mid-50% of students at their school. Where are you going to fit in academically? Are you going to be right there in that mid-50%? Might you be in the top quartile? Or might you be looking at schools where your scores, your GPA, your scores, would be in the lower quartile? How are you going to gauge where you can be the most academically successful? So that's, those are the concepts of what we would call academic fit. Now let's move over to this idea of feel. When we talk about feel, we're really not talking about something that you can quantify. You can't go to data and really get a sense of feel. It may evolve around location, right? I mean, there are some students that like the idea of living at home. They would feel most comfortable living at home and still taking college classes. You have some students that don't want to live at home, but they do want to live close enough to home because they might want to be home on weekends. You have some students that want to get out and maybe come home on Christmas or Easter, you know, occasionally during the course of the year. So location can be a variable that relates to feel. Another variable, again, gauging the atmosphere of a university, might be the weekend experiences. What is the weekend going to be like? What, is, what kind of a social atmosphere do you want in terms of a weekend experience? We'll also talk about how the, um, the dimension of size of the university can influence feel. And I'm going to get into that in a little bit uh, more depth in a bit. But this concept of feel, even though, you know, specifically, and, and for the most part, you, can, you can't look at it from a data-driven standpoint, there is a piece of data that might help you. And that is what we call retention. So every university posts a retention percentage. And that's the percentages of students that indeed stay at the university, continue on from freshman to sophomore year. If you see university post retention statistics of about 80% or higher, usually that's a very strong satisfaction level. And when you get into the 90s, it's exceptionally strong. You see some universities that say 70% of, of our students return freshman to sophomore year. You might wonder if kids are literally happy at those places. So that's a, a data point, but the idea of feel is something you have to check out. And then finally, and, and significantly for many families, are the financial implications of this. And so we're going to get into depth on this whole issue and we do this at a, a program every year called Conquering College Costs, where we really try to get into the, the, the weeds of the topic of cost. Because you can see from the pictures uh, that uh, indeed are part of the video here behind me, students go to a lot of different colleges across the country. Providence students go to 81 different schools across the country last year. And here are pictures of some of our students that have gone to some of the more prominent ones where multiple students have gone to different schools. And in many of these cases, students, our students are going to colleges with scholarship dollars. And so obviously, we don't want you to focus on the sticker price of institutions. We want you to focus on what we call net price. What will actually be your cost? And how is that going to fit in 
to the idea of affordability. So these are the topics that we really are going to want to explore and marry as we develop this idea of fit. Academic fit, feel, and also financial. All right, so the next topic I want to talk about is how we place colleges in categories. And in looking at different categories, how we can imagine taking these three topics, academics, feel, and fit, based on the category. Now, there's a reason why we do this, a a method of our madness. Obviously, we're talking about over 2,000 four-year institutions across the country. And so even though all of them are going to be a little different, when you group colleges, you group universities in categories, they have very similar characteristics. So let's take the first category, the flagship state school. Now, the flagship state school is the premier state-supported institution in a given state, the largest. And so you typically you look at Illinois, and you know what it is. It's the University of Illinois at Urbana. You, you, you walk into Indiana, and they would tell you both Purdue and Indiana University would be the flagships. And you go into the, to Iowa, and you certainly would be the University of Iowa and, and so forth. So you get the idea, right? So let's, let's look at these state-supported institutions, these flagships, from an academic point of view. Because they are very large, that means they're going to have the largest number of course offerings and majors. So typically, when you have a particular major in mind, if you're, you're looking at will it be available at a flagship, it normally is. Now, it, that's not the case at every flagship, but you're going to have a greater chance of having majors being offered at flagships than any other institution because they're going to offer the most number. And because they're flagships, because they're generally selective, they're going to probably have high quality connected to them from an academic point of view. Now, will you be academically successful at flagships? Well, that's where you want to gauge this mid-50% and see where you fall in. Because generally, flagships are rather selective in nature. And so typically, the student population is going to be quite strong at a number of the different flagships. Now, let's look at it from a field standpoint. Well, what kind of atmosphere are you going to find at a flagship state school? They're going to be very large. And so the idea of intimacy in the classroom experience is probably not their strength. You might have very large lecture halls at flagship state schools. So their strength academically is clearly number of programs and quality of program. It may not be that intimate relationship with the professor and the student that you might find at at different places. How is that going to make you feel? Is that the atmosphere you're going to want? That gets to this question of feel, right? But what's the social life going to be like at a flagship state school? Well, this is where the big arenas are, right? These are the big football and the big basketball campuses. And so if that's what you're looking for, that flagship state school might fit the feel that you want. And, of course, from a location standpoint, there are flagships in every state. And so you can pretty much look at flagships in many, many states and see some very similar characteristics. Now let's get to the money issue. This is an intriguing category because what we find here is that there are a number of flagship state schools that are not very willing to reduce their sticker price. For example, in the Midwest, the University of Illinois is a wonderful institution, and a number of our students go there, but they're not really good at the reduction of sticker price. So scholarship opportunities are not very uh, prevalent at a place like the University of Illinois. And there's several other flagship state schools that are like that. Purdue is much like that. The University of Wisconsin-Madison is much like that. University of Michigan is like that. Now, there are other Midwest flagships that will provide some of that financial relief in terms of scholarships. And you'll see these in your research. But the most, uh, the greatest opportunity in this area of ways to get that sticker price reduced is if you were to look at flagships south. 
So we've had a lot of success with our students. When they start looking at schools that might be south of here that are flagships, or even west. And when I think of west, I think of Kansas and Nebraska, usually not Colorado. All right, let's now move over to something that is the next category, which would be the non-flagship state school. So let's take a, a frame of reference here, and let's use our own state as an example. We know that the University of Illinois is the flagship state school, but we also know that there are a number of other state schools, right? You have Illinois State and Northern and Eastern, Western and Southern and so forth, right? So these are schools that are also large, but not as large. They have a lot of programs, but not as many programs. Aren't as selective, still somewhat selective, but aren't as selective, greater opportunity for admission, and a little more willingness to offer dollars on the scholarship side. Now, I'm going to share this with you all, and that is there is one of these that has been a big driver of interest for Providence kids, and it's Illinois State. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that, one of which is it, in terms of proximity, it's easy to get to. It's only about an hour and a half, right down I-55. So a number of our students like that. And what happens is, and this is the case in a lot of different um, universities, you know, our graduates come back and they talk to us. And, you know, you'll see them at Christmas mass or during that Christmas break a lot or sometimes in the spring during their break. And we're always checking with them about their satisfaction level. You know, and they, and they tell us, you know, what, what places they really like and they talk about it from a feel standpoint. And we do get a lot of positive uh, feedback from the students that go to ISU. Now, that's not taking away from anything from the other flagship state schools, but the number of applicants we would get at a place like ISU as a non-flagship state school is quite significant. Now, there are a number of non-flagships outside of Illinois that have attracted our students' attention, and the primary reason for that is financial incentives. So if you look at a Grand Valley state or a Western Michigan or a Central Michigan in Michigan or a Truman state in Missouri or a number of, of the, of the uh, non-flagship state schools, let's say in Wisconsin, all of the universities in Wisconsin that aren't Madison, there are big financial incentives that these institutions have put into place and therefore they may be attractive to some of our students. All right, let's move over now to a very interesting category of schools. And we call this category the highly selectives. And one of the things you're going to notice uh, as, you, as you kind of peruse the next few pages, I know I, know I, I went through the flagships and you see example colleges on your, on your handouts, and we go through the non-flagships and you see example colleges. You're going to notice that in these examples, I actually prioritize them based on letters. We give them A, Bs, or Cs. This directly relates to how generous they are, typically, in the area of offering aid, offering scholarships. But I don't give examples in the highly selective category because you know who these schools are, right? You know that the Ivies are in this category. You know that places like Notre Dame, uh, Northwestern, University of Chicago are in this category. So... What do we know about these institutions academically? They're the best. They're the tops. They're the ones that everyone knows that it's the most difficult institution to get into. And many, many of the students that get into these particular institutions are extraordinarily gifted, extraordinarily bright. And so that's where their prestige, their image comes from. So all of the programs they offer are going to be very, very strong academically. So one of the things that we always say about the pursuit of highly selectives is you're a good student at Providence Catholic. You come from a, a high school that has strong college prep courses, tremendous rigor. There is nothing wrong with investigating and exploring highly selectives. There's nothing wrong in applying to highly selectives. You just can't only apply to these institutions because no matter how strong a student you are, it is an oftentimes a crapshoot as to whether or not students will get accepted at these highly selective institutions. Certainly, 
we have had students at Providence that have applied and been accepted and have chosen some wonderful places. Typically, we get students that go to Notre Dame, get students that go to Villanova, and schools like this. But you have to be aware of the fact you can't just only apply to these schools. Now, they're usually not very generous financially on the scholarship end of things. And so they're not into the world of offering merit-based scholarships like many of these other types of institutions. But that doesn't mean that it might not work for you financially. And so if, if you, know, you, your son or daughter, if I'm talking to the parent, has a capacity to pursue these highly selectives, you might try looking at a couple of net price calculators. I'm going to talk about net price calculators in a lot of, great ta- a lot, a lot of detail when we get into our Conquering College Cost video. But generally, net price calculators are software programs that give you estimates of what you'll actually pay institutions. Go to the Harvard net price calculator, go to the uh, Vanderbilt net price calculator, and that'll give you an idea of what these costs might look like at these high list selectives, because they are very expensive from a sticker price standpoint, somewhere in that 70 to 80 K per year period uh, or, or dollar amount. All right, let's move to a very popular category for Providence Catholic students. And we call this the mid-size privates. Now, there's not a lot of mid-size privates uh, across the country, but they typically have very recognizable names. You've all have heard of Loyola and DePaul in, in uh, Chicagoland area. You've heard of Marquette. You probably have heard of St. Louis University or the University of Dayton or Xavier. You might not have heard of the University of Tampa or a place like Grand Canyon, But I would say to you that these are not small institutions. They typically have 7,000 or more, sometimes up to that 15,000 threshold. That's typically their their student population base. And they have a number of programs because of their size. But they have an atmosphere that is very much like the Providence atmosphere. Um, To be honest with you, much of this is driven because of the fact that a lot of these institutions have a faith-based connection. Many of them are Catholic colleges, Catholic universities. And so it seems to draw a number of our students. And when you get to the financial aspects, they are all, all going to offer Providence students scholarship dollars. And so they become a very attractive category. And then we have this final category. And this is the category of the smaller institutions. We're going to call them the traditional privates. And so again, I'm showing you more examples of the mid-sized privates and then the traditional privates. Not to give you the idea that these are all of the colleges in this category, because there's more traditional privates than any other category of institutions. But these are a few examples. And what they offer is this intimacy in the classroom this opportunity to really develop relationship with professor, this individual attention. And what is striking about these universities, these colleges, is that the the opportunities to participate are great. So you have a student, for example, who's an athlete in high school. They kind of gravitate to these types of institutions because I might be able to continue to play my sport at that school. And oftentimes the college welcomes that. Or if I'm in in drama or if I write for the school newspaper, if I'm in band or choir. So these opportunities continue on, especially at these traditional privates. That means more money typically in the form of scholarship. And these opportunities that students have is something that really is important to them. And they want to continue to do this. Not that it can't be done at the mid-sized privates. Not that it can't be done at the bigger state schools. It's just more prevalent here at the traditional privates. And these where the opportunities lie. And therefore, there are some students, many of our students, that gravitate toward these particular schools. So when you look at the board, you see a wide range of different types here, right? These are examples of of institutions that our students have chosen. These are students that have matriculated to these students. This is last year's graduating class. And, And indeed... Um, oh, let me put take that back. What class is this? This is the class of 2021. So it won't be this 
current group of seniors. We'll get those pictures out later in the year. Uh, but anyway, what you see is when three, four students, I think it's four students or more, would attend different places. So you have state-supported institutions, flagships, University of Illinois, Alabama, Iowa, Indiana, Purdue, non-flagships, Illinois State, Western Michigan, Grand Valley, mid-sized privates, places like Loyola, University of Dayton, Marquette, traditional privates like St. Mary's, St. Xavier, Lewis, and so forth. So you get the idea here that our students have a tendency to gravitate toward a number of different institutions based on the three variables, right? Academics, feel, and financial. Uh, one of the things that you're going to see next is a list of all of the universities that have visited Providence Catholic in 2021. You know, um, obviously we've gone through the COVID experience, and during the COVID experience, all of the visits were done via Zoom meetings or some sort of online uh, platform, and the, uni and the university set up those visits with our students. This past year, we were fortunate that the, the universities were able to actually come and have one-on-one -on -one or small group visits with students. So as juniors, we want to invite you to take advantage of this. Make sure early on in senior year, you look through the visits, these, these colleges that are coming in the fall, and sign up. You sign up with Mrs. Brazel, our administrative assistant, so that you can actually make this visit with these college representatives. You know, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of speaking with college reps. And a lot of it is certainly done here at Providence Catholic when they're here to visit. But you're going to see college reps when you visit college campuses. How are you going to get a sense of feel unless you're actually on a college campus visiting, right? So you're going to certainly get that sense when you're visiting uh, on college campuses. You might be talking to college reps when you're at college fairs. We're going to show you some dates later of some college fairs. You want to understand that a part of this communication that you would have with college reps is a tremendous learning tool for you. You look, want to look at these as literally job applications where you're establishing, you're attempting to establish rapport. You want these reps to get to know you. You know, in many cases, these are the same individuals that are going to actually be reading your application if you do apply to their institutions. And so if you can create an impression, communicate with them, that you know you uh, you know you ask good questions, you introduce yourself, you look them in the eye. It, it just it really can go a long way in this whole process. A great learning tool for you as you go on in life, and you're going to be obviously interviewing for jobs uh, and and maybe positions even on college campuses. It's a great opportunity to take advantage of when you're speaking with college representatives. What would I ask? a college rep. This is a typical question that will come up. So we've, we have a tool here for you where we give you a whole series of example questions. So take advantage of these. Don't go in and try to memorize it. You have to ask every one of these questions, but it's background information for you. It's helpful information so that when you're speaking with a college rep, you give the impression that you really care about learning as much as you possibly can about their university. All right, I want to go over some important dates, and I want to talk a little bit about testing and literally how things have changed in relationship to testing. So obviously, when if we were having a conversation with students and parents three years ago, four years ago, we would say that every institution, just about every institution, would take the combination of a student's academic performance in the classroom and then they would also look at their academic performance as it relates to standardized testing. Let's use the ACT as the example because it's the test that all of our students at Providence have taken historically and the test that most of the institutions in the Midwest would prefer. So let's use the ACT as an example. Could easily be the SAT. Every, every university will take either. So that was always the case in the past. When COVID entered the scene, Colleges made a decision to be test optional. And what we have learned is they have continued to carry that forward. So we can't guarantee you that every university you look at will be test optional. 
but I will bet you that at least 90% of the universities you examine will be. So what exactly does test optional mean? Well, it means that you have a tremendous advantage because what you're going to be able to do is prepare if you choose, but certainly take the ACT test sometime this spring. Now, Every ACT test you take prior to April, so if you took one already, or if you take one in February, fine. Think of those as practice. You've got a practice in, you're getting used to taking the exam, that's great. You might take a prep class, right? We have a prep class that's being offered at Providence Catholic. You probably already have gotten some information on it, or you will be getting that information. There are outside entities that offer prep, prep classes, Many of those are excellent in terms of preparation. But in any regard, whether you take a prep class or not, you take that ACT in April or June or July, certainly can retake it if you choose in the beginning of senior year. But the point is, that's when you start to examine that score. And you say to yourself, how am I representing myself with that score? Is it a score that I believe along with my GPA, along with my coursework, really paints a very positive picture of me. Now, we've had students ask the question, what's the score, that the composite score, that you would say to yourself, I should send? Because that's going to be the benefit. You're going to be able to determine yourself whether you want your test score to be included in their examination when you actually apply. None of these test scores are going to be placed on transcripts. And so you will have to order the test score you want sent to the institutions you want. So the question again is, what test score should I say, okay, if I get to this threshold, I should include? If you're looking at most flagship state schools, non-flagship state schools, mid-sized privates or traditional privates, you get to about that 25 or higher threshold, that's a supplement to your GPA, you're going to want to include that. They're going to see that as something that will add to your application and potentially add to the possibilities of scholarship dollars. However, if it's lower than that, especially if it's significantly lower than that, you're probably better off not including it in your, in your file and just having them reflect on your GPA and your coursework. And what all of the universities have told us, it, it will not be to your detriment. That's why they've gone to this test optional mode, not only admission, but also on the scholarship side. Now, let's look at the highly selectives. So let's say you are going to pursue a Notre Dame. You are going to pursue a, a Villanova or a Stanford obviously one of the institutions that we consider to be highly selective or, or multiple of these schools. Well, the 25 wouldn't set you apart, obviously. And so you might have straight A's, have taken honors and AP courses, and you want to apply to those highly selectives, but maybe you have a 26 or 27. That score is not going to set you apart, and so you probably wouldn't want to include it. So you might include it at those other institutions, but you probably wouldn't want to include it in the pursuit of the highly selective. So, and again, we can work with you individually when you get your results to determine, to help you determine whether you should include it in the process of applying. But what you do see on the screen are the dates, the important dates, the sign-up dates and the actual test date. And so we will be a test center. Providence Catholic is a test center in April but you can take these ACT tests at a number of different places. But if you want to take it at Providence, we are a test center in April, not at the June test date, not in July. But you can take a look at those uh, dates. And you go right to the ACT or the SAT website, which we've listed on, this, uh, on the handout uh, to allow you to, to get in and actually register for these tests. Now, a couple of other important dates. Notice on Wednesday, March 23rd, is the big college fair at Joliet Junior College. This is a must. This is something that I would highly recommend you take advantage of. So there will be 200 colleges, universities present at Joliet Junior College that night. And you'll get an, an email that shows you the link where you'll be able to look at all of these universities who are coming. In one evening, you're going to be able to make a contact 
with a number of different college reps. Now, you don't want to go into these college fairs unprepared. You know, you can imagine the scene, right? Colleges are sitting behind tables. They have all of their brochures and view books and information in front of them. They want you to fill out a card so they can get uh, your data into their database. All of that is part of the process. But if all you're doing is, is thinking of it like a mall and you're just going around picking up brochures, you're really not going to accomplish much. Going into the fair, you want to identify 8, 10, 12 universities and you want to make sure those are the people you speak with. You've already done your research through Naviance, this program that Mr. Murphy's going to show you. You've got your list of schools, and now you're going in and saying, I want to ask some key questions of these reps, or at least I want them to get to know who I am. I want them to know that I'm a Providence Catholic student, that I'm interested in their university, and I want them to talk about Maybe it's the business program or the nursing program or the engineering program because those are the areas of interest you have. So take advantage of the college fair at Joliet Junior College. Then on April 6th, every year, Julie Nelson, now she's a veteran college admissions person from Xavier University, and she has a wonderful presentation for students and parents, especially parents, but certainly we'd encourage students to come as well that evening. You know, you're going to hear from me. You've heard from me uh, through the video and, and a number of families obviously are coming in to see us in small groups. You're going to hear from Mr. Murphy. We're going to work with you. You're, we're going to work with your son or daughter throughout the application process. But it's always good to get another voice. And so here we have this veteran college admissions person, and she's going to do a presentation to give you a little bit of a different perspective than our perspective on this entire process. So that's Wednesday, uh, April 6th. And then we're going to have a fair here at Providence. That's April 8th. Now that's during the day, during all of the lunch periods in TDT, and it'll give all of the juniors, and even we're going to invite sophomores, an opportunity to visit with, there's about 70 uh, universities that'll come that day. And it'll be in the, in the, uh, in the gymnasium. They'll, again, they'll, it'll be look just like the college fair at Julia Junior College, just a smaller number. But a great opportunity, again, to make contact with college reps. All right, let's continue on. So we'll have a program very specific to phase two. Because what we're doing in the video and what Mr. Murphy is going to be doing in his screencast is we're talking about the exploration phase. We don't want you to think about apl applications. But we're going to get to that, and we're going to get to it the first week you come back as a senior, because during that week, Mr. Murphy and I will take over one of your classes, and for the entire class period, all we're going to talk about is the application phase. Very simply, how do you put your best foot forward to these universities? What is the best way to apply so that you are impressing them as best you possibly can? We'll do that the first week of school when you're a senior. We will duplicate that program for parents sometime the f and during the fall. So you're going to be looking for an email, parents of juniors, when you hit senior year and come to that program. Because, you know, it's very important that everybody's on the same page, right? It, this is a team effort. We don't get these kind of results unless everyone's working together. The student, the counselor, and certainly the parents. Everybody on the same page to get the kind of results that we get. We'll have a, a, a FAFSA filing explanation and a Conquering College Cost program in October. So all of this relates to the money aspect of the process, and certainly we'll get into that as well. So those dates have yet to be determined, but you'll be getting them. All right, this handout is a synthesis, a very, very short synthesis of the details of conquering college costs. And it really, I present it just as a teaser to you. Uh, it is just something to have as background information. I just want to get it out there and just remind you the importance of the financial aspects of the college process. But we're going to get into that in great detail in the conquering college cost presentation. All right. So uh, that's, that's the, uh, the video portion uh, what I call the kind of the explanation of how we put the college search and selection process together. 
The companion to this is the screencast that Mr. Murphy's providing. And really spend some time with this. And what I would like you to do is to make sure, like hopefully you did with the video, do this with your son or daughter. Literally look over their shoulder. They'll have their Naviance program up. And as Mr. Murphy is describing it for you and going over these details, be there with them so that you get acclimated and you as a parent understand the Naviance search program as well as the student does. All right, final point. Always, always, always know that we're here for you. Mr. Murphy and I are here for your sons and daughters, here for you as parents. You're a phone call away. You're an email away. We can set up individual visits if you need. Our whole purpose is to make sure that your son or daughter gets to the place they want to get to and you, as a parent, are able to afford it.